the sixth trumpet period involved the expansion of the Saracens, those Islamic armies that came from the Euphrates region of the Middle East and invaded Europe. The next event recorded by the sixth trumpet was a great earthquake, which we saw was the French Revolution of 1789. We then looked at the sixth vile period and saw how it relates to our day and age with the Euphrates, uh, the once mighty Ottoman Empire now drying up, which began in 1820. The next sign of the sixth vial we should expect to see after the Turkish Ottoman Empire dries up is the unleashing of the frog-like demonic spirits of human reasoning and revolution. So what was started in the sixth trumpet by the French Revolution now manifests itself in the sixth vial in a world that croaks the ideals of the French Revolution, the language of liberty, equality, and fraternity. And this will be our consideration, brothers and sisters, for our second session together, which we've entitled Three Unclean Spirits Like Frogs. Since the three symbols that we saw in Revelation chapter 16, all speak frog, we need to refresh our minds as to who they are. The first symbol was the dragon, and we saw it answered to the military power of the Eastern Roman Empire that moved from Constantinople to Moscow in the mid-1400s. Russia today now symbolizes and embodies the characteristics of this dragon empire. There are two beasts referred to in Revelations, the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth. And you find those in Revelations 13, verse 1 and verse 11. Now the latter beast is referred to in Revelation 16 and 10, and it relates to the Holy Roman Empire and the Germanic Federation. Its headquarters was originally located in Vienna, but with the fall of the empire, the center of Germanic influence moved to Berlin. Regardless, the symbol points to Central Europe, dominated by German industry, influence, and finance. The beast is a symbol of the united political powers of Europe, which have recently revived as Revelations 17 and verse 8 predicts. So we should expect to see these frog-like spirits increase in strength from this region of the world. And it's interesting that today the European Union meets in Strasbourg, France. France, this, this city of Strasbourg, is a symbol of Franco-German reconciliation and European integration. It was after the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg around 1440 that the first printing offices outside his hometown of Mainz was actually established in the city of Strasbourg. And so printing, printing, which is the precursor of the internet, later created an environment that was very favorable to humanism, which was used to turn out literature that pointed out ecclesiastical uh, challenges and abuses within the Catholic Church. And this prepared the grounds for Protestantism. And it's also worth noting that Strasbourg today also houses the European court of human rights. It's not that difficult to identify the beast as Europe with its heartbeat being that of Germany. Have you ever wondered why Nazi Germany came up with the name the Third Reich, which simply means the Third Empire? Well, the Third Reich was the Nazi designation for the regime in Germany from January 1933 to May 1945. They saw themselves as the successors of the Holy Roman Empire. So Hitler tried to unite Europe and revive the Holy Roman Empire. So the first Reich was the Holy Roman Empire of 800 to 1806 AD. The second Reich being the German Republic of 1871 to 1918. He's tried to start the third Reich 
in Nazi Germany in 1933, and we know that that finished up in 1945. So he tried to unite Europe. He tried to revive the Holy Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, to reestablish the western leg of that empire and even control the eastern leg with the invasion of Russia, which was not to be. The, B, the Bible has declared that the Western Empire and the Eastern Empire would remain separate, although united in purpose, and they will stand again in the last days. Is it any wonder then why the Vatican was so supportive of Hitler's quest to reestablish the Holy Roman Empire? Brothers and sisters, Rome is still behind the beast empire of Europe today. And this brings us then to the third symbol described in Revelation chapter 16. What about the mouth of the false prophet? Well, a false prophet is one who proclaims error. We find that in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. So the false prophet is the pope with his headquarters in Rome. We read the description in Daniel 8, verse 25. It says, through peace he shall destroy many. So Daniel 8 and Revelation 13 have this idea of a similar description of this false prophet who deceives and makes war with the saints. And so these symbols match up to these areas as shown on this map of Europe. The frog-length spirits that emanated from France have been embraced by the power of the European beast, dominated, as we said, by a very strong German influence. And they're headquartered today in, as we said, Strasbourg and also in Brussels. The papacy is headquartered in Rome and it answers to the false prophet who also speaks the language of frogs. And finally, Russia itself that answers to the Eastern Roman Empire, who through military might have also learned to speak the language of the frog-like spirits. So and we're going to see some examples of that in our third session. Now we can, of course, start to see how these three symbols are interacting with each other. It is the demonic spirits that are going to go and gather the nations uniting Europe to bring together, to assemble the nations. So the gathering has both a political and a religious aspect to it because the dragon and the beast, the military and political powers, as well as the false prophet religious powers, are actively involved. And of course, we've seen a number of signposts in recent history showing the closeness of these political, military and religious entities. We just think back to 1957 with the Treaty of Rome, the foundation really of the European Union. In 1963, the Vatican II that promoted uh, the ecumenical movement. In 1989, Gorbachev called for a united European home. He called it a common European home. In 1990, we saw the unification of Germany. In 1993, Russia signed a declaration with the European Union aimed at strengthening relations between the two countries. So there's been a lot of bonding and closeness and unity as they're starting to be unified, as these spirits are unifying these different symbols together. The dragon and the beast are closer than ever. When we just even look at trade between Russia and the European Union. Russia is the European Union's fifth largest trading partner and the EU is Russia's biggest trading partner. Russia is the origin of 26% of the EU's oil imports and 40% of its gas imports. So both Russia and Europe are dependent on each other like never before in history. Russian gas is like the blood that feeds the European beast. And on the screen, you see the depiction. It shows the oil and the gas pipelines that are coming out of Russia that are feeding Europe. And Europe is now dependent on the gas and the fuel that is coming from the dragon image of Russia. 
Well, let's read Revelation 16 and verses 12 and 13, where we are introduced to the spirits of demons. These unclean spirits we read in verse 14, for they are the spirits of devils or demons, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So they're eventually going to unite the nations against Christ. So what powerful spirits they must be to have this kind of influence and this kind of devastating effect. Well, we learn a number of principles regarding frogs from the very first time they are mentioned in scriptures. So Revelations introduces us to these three unclean spirits like frogs. Well, let's turn with me now, please, to Exodus chapter 8 and verse 3, where we read about the plague of the frogs that God brought upon Egypt through the hand of Moses. So in Exodus 8 and verse 3 we read, And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house and into thy bedchamber, upon thy bed and into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people and into thine ovens and into thy kneading troughs. So God used frogs to plague Egypt in a bid to free his people. Well, what can we learn then from this plague? Well, the first thing is that we learn back in Leviticus is that Leviticus tells us that frogs are classified as unclean animals. So if people are going to speak frog-like, or there'll be frog-like spirits, we know that it's going to be unclean. There's going to be something wicked. It won't be good. Secondly, they multiplied rapidly. They were everywhere, Exodus 8, verses 3 and 4 says. They affected all levels of Egyptian society. Thirdly, the frogs even affected Israel. So God's people would not be spared from the effects of these frogs. And we would take that, brothers and sisters, that we too will not be spared from this influence of the frog-like spirits, as we'll see later. God wants us also to see that the frogs are associated with a false sense of liberty. Pharaoh, out of his mouth, says, I will let the people go. You can go, Moses. You can take the people. Well, here was a promise of freedom and liberty, but it was broken as soon as he got respite from the plague. And fifth, the frogs corrupted the land. In Psalm 78, verse 45, we read, He sent divers sorts of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs, which destroyed them. And that word destroyed means corrupted. It's the same word used in Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. And it's used to describe the days of Noah. For all flesh and here's our word, had corrupted his way upon the earth. And it's a great symbol for spiritual corruption. As Exodus 8 verse 14 says, and the land stank because of them. And this was due to corruption. The frogs were everywhere, even in their bedrooms, and no doubt descriptive of the moral and spiritual decline of Egypt. The promise of liberty and the stench of corruption accompany the frog plague. Psalm 105 and verse 30 is a very interesting psalm because in Psalm 105 and verse 30 we read, their land brought forth frogs in abundance in the chambers of their kings. And you'll notice, brothers and sisters, as you read through Psalm 105, there's, and you come to that verse 30, there's no mention that God did it. Now, we know that God did it, but every other verse in Psalm 105 says God did it. 
But it's almost like the scriptures is giving us the point here that this is about human doing. The corruption like frogs is human doing. These kings, these princes, were like other false teachers in the New Testament. And that Peter warns us about, where he tells us these teachers in the New Testament, in the Ecclesias, were also offering false promises. And so we see in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18 and 19, you'll notice a little bit of a similar language. For when they speak, and I, as you go through it, you can almost picture a frog puffing up. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. Well, they promise them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. So the corrupting influence of false teachers sadly had their effects on the ecclesia as well. And note the promise of freedom that was offered through their teachings. They promise liberty, but since they are enslaved to sin, they are actually promising more slavery, not liberty at all. I'm going to read 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18-19. I'll read it in the net if you, you follow along in the King James Version. We have it on the screen. For by speaking high-sounding but empty words, they are able to entice with fleshly desires and with debauchery people who have just escaped from those who reside in error. So although these false teachers promise people freedom, they themselves are enslaved to immorality. For, as Peter says, for whatever a person succumbs to, to that he is enslaved. So the type of liberty that man offers is not liberty. It is not freedom. These are false promises, and we need to see them that way. The false doctrine we are warned about and yet we see so passionately preached by our society today is without any doubt humanism. The belief that human beings are independent of God. The idea that as long as a human does not directly hurt another human, then they can do whatever they want, whatever is right in their own eyes. This idea that all human opinion is valid. This is a false idea of liberty. It basically makes no opinion valid, especially not God's. It kills the concept of truth, brothers and sisters. It is a doctrine which makes men apathetic to the true problem of sin against Almighty God and that they have a nature. We have a nature that is bent towards disobedience to his ways. Humanism, human rights, equality has really been finally developed in modern times since the French Revolution. But it can now be found in all levels of society. It has corrupted many. It's gone everywhere, just like that frog plague. And it's brought them to hate or become apathetic to God and his principles. But Peter warns us that this will affect the ecclesia. And more about this in our third session together. Well, the symbolism of the frogs with their swelling, corrupting influence is wonderfully picked up in Revelation. And you don't have to search too hard to see that frogs share a strong association with France. Uh, more importantly, with the ideology that has emanated from France. Many people today still refer to the French people, however, in a derogatory way, as frogs. The French, as a little aside, are the largest um, consumers of frog legs in the world. It's been a part of their diet for over a thousand years. And by the way, very few religions, if any, have an understanding of these frog-like spirits. 
You look on the internet and you try to find anybody that can figure out what these frog-like spirits are. You've got ideas of devils and demons all over the place. Brothers and sisters, we are very fortunate for the work of our pioneers to see what these frog-like spirits are. They've gone out to deceive the world. And how thankful we are that we're able to understand these symbols. Well, this political uh, cartoon that you see on, our, our, your, in, on your screen there was done in November 1799. And it shows Napoleon Bonaparte as a crocodile. Now, the reason that they depict him as a crocodile is that he just came back from his campaign in Egypt. So they likened him to the crocodiles of Egypt, and he's come back, and the cartoonist depicts him when he goes into the orangery of St. Cloud. Now, this is a building that's just a little outside of Paris, and this is where the, the, um, the French dignitaries met. And he was trying to take over more control. The French dignitaries uh, didn't like it so much, and so they, this council gathered together to oppose Napoleon. And the council was called the Council of the 500. And they are depicted in the cartoon as frogs. Some wearing bonnets and red cloaks. And he wears a saber. He's got his military boots. And he's got a crown, which is interesting for other reasons. And you got one little helpless frog, and he tries to stab him because he was actually tried to be assassinated in, in this, uh, when he came. But of course, uh, there's nothing they could do against this, this giant. So this is the, the two incursions of Napoleon into the Council of the 500 are combined into this one particular cartoon. But what's really interesting to us is that a cartoon like this could register its meaning so clearly without any verbal explanation. That's how familiar people were with the stereotype of the frogs as related to the French. Well, the French or Franks, as they were originally known, have been associated with the symbol of frogs for centuries. Uh, Brother Thomas in Alpus Israel noted that the first Christian king of France, whose name was King Clovis, came from the Mars regions of Westphalia. And a bronze statue was made of Clovis, and it can still be seen today in the museum in Austria. It shows on one half of his shield were depicted three fleur-de-lis, and on the other side were three corresponding frogs. And in 1996, they celebrated the 1500th anniversary of the conversion to Catholicism by Clovis, and it was celebrated in Reims, France. And this picture that you see here was placed on posters celebrating the event. And the picture was actually from a tapestry that was put together for the occasion, as well as from some other ancient tapestries. And note the prominence of the frogs. Uh, many of today's liberal philosophies actually resemble the spirit of the ancient barbarian Franks, from where France comes from. The name of the Franks is from the Latin francus, meaning free. So these free and warlike barbarians originally were actually very interesting, a Germanic people. They overran the Gauls and they established the nation we now know today as France. So their adoption of the Gallo-Roman Catholic culture was the seed of the French civilization, and hence that of medieval and modern Western Europe. The Franks overcame the Roman Empire, but not the priests of Catholic Rome, because don't forget, Clovis became a Catholic. He was baptized a Catholic. So liberty and freedom actually became the servants of corruption. They became the servants of a spiritually corrupt Roman Catholic system. So the Franks had an ideology that was also very unique to their character. Later, these characteristics were to spring forth from French philosophers as they found political expression in the French Revolution of 1789. And of course, the aftermath with Napoleon as it went spread throughout uh, Europe. Uh, Gerald Simmons in the book Barbarian Europe he describes the barbarian tribes that invaded the Roman Empire and brought about its destruction. He says, they stubbornly clung to their tribal attitude toward law and the rights of the individual. So these tribes from this Westphalia region and these areas started to breed already this idea of the rights of the individual. And thereby, he says, preserved a priceless tradition until the time for democracy was ripe. 
They led all others in personal freedoms. The very concept of progress, the belief in the inevitable and continuous betterment of man can be traced to ideas born in this barbarian epoch, says Gerald Simmons. Uh, Edward Gibbons is a book that we're probably more familiar with, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. He writes, the love of liberty was the ruling passion of the Frankish barbarians who originated in Westphalia, Germany. They deserved, they assumed, they maintained the honorable epitaph of Franks or free men. So these frog-like spirits of liberalism infiltrated the fabric of French thinking until it culminated in the French Revolution. No republic was going to serve a king. After all, they were free men. Well, in the 1700s, France is now ripe for a revolution. The people were poor, and they served under the nobility and church. A freedom, a false freedom and liberty, eventually came along. Men like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and probably better known for us, Voltaire, who started to develop the French philosophies. And their social doctrine was unity, liberty, equality, fraternity. And it was a rebirth of the barbarian Franks or free men. It was demonical. It really was a plague of frogs. Uh, the British historian uh, Thomas Carlyle described the French Revolution this way. He says, what is this thing called la Revolution? It is the madness that dwells in the hearts of men, in all men, each man enveloped in his ambient atmosphere of revolutionary fanatic madness. So we saw this period of time of history as this absolute madness, this, which really captures the, the idea of a demonic spirit. It made people mad. The revolution actually produced what was called the reign of terror. So here they are in the revolution of 1789, promising liberty, equality, fraternity, and they actually introduced the reign of terror rather than liberty. And this resulted from the frenzy of the people. The nobles and those in authority, they lost their heads in the guillotine. Tens of thousands as the guillotine swung down. And as with the frogs of Europe, brothers and sisters, corruption was a byproduct of the plague. So with the philosophy that gave rise to the French Revolution in the name of liberty, it actually brought corruption. So these unclean spirits were to permeate Europe, entering into the chambers of their kings. And so actually countless wars and revolutions resulted from these spirits being unleashed across Europe, even to America. Napoleon himself used it like Pharaoh did so many thousands of years before as a deceptive way of crying liberty to, to enhance France's glory and himself and caused all kinds of wars and destruction. So from a scriptural point of view, frog-like spirits of the French Revolution actually overthrew the Catholic fleur-de-lis. And the shockwaves of the French Revolution have affected us for the last 200 years. These principles have performed miracles in the fields of politics, economics, education, inventions, industry, the arts, science, ethics, and religion. As man has sought liberty, every avenue of social and political life has been transformed. And in spite of the miraculous age in which we live, men are still trying to find true liberty. It eludes them. The ideology that sprang from the French Revolution did produce a document, though, that has changed our world. It was a document, I think you can see from the, from the way the document was drawn up, it actually is made to look, I think, a little bit like the Ten Commandments. It's called the Declaration of the Rights of Man. And the irony, of course, is that God is missing. This was developed and designed by men for mankind. This 1789 declaration was a crystallization of the Enlightenment ideals. According to one historian, it was, it was 
stunning in its sweep and simplicity. It encapsulated the natural and civil rights espoused by um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and even Thomas Jefferson in the United States and entrenched them in French law. The Declaration was a short document, only had 17 clauses to it, and it contained uh, this preamble which we put on the screen here. And so these articles provided protection for numerous individual rights. It provided for liberty, property, freedom of speech, the press, freedom of religion, equal treatment before the law. The Declaration guaranteed property rights, inserted that people had to pay their taxes. It also asserted the concept of popular sovereignty, the idea that law and government existed to serve the public and not suppress it. It sounds not bad, doesn't it? They even reference a supreme being, but God and his principles are missing. And so we read on the screen, the Declaration of the Human Rights approved by the National Assembly of France, the representatives of the French people <clears throat> organized as a national assembly, believing that the ignorance, neglect, or contempt of the rights of man are the sole cause of public calamities and of the corruption of governments, have determined to set forth in a solemn declaration the natural, unalienable, and sacred rights of man, in order that this declaration, being constantly before all the members of the social body, shall remind them continually of their rights and duties. Therefore, the National Assembly recognizes and proclaims in the presence and under the auspices of the Supreme Being the following rights of man and of the citizen. And God is now nowhere in sight. This, brothers and sisters, is the document that serves as the basis for the most modern declaration of human rights that exists in the world today. This present-day human rights declaration affects all aspects of our businesses, our educational system, social organization, and even relations between countries. We're talking, of course, about the universal declaration of human rights created by the United Nations in a very interesting year, 1948. So after World War II, there was a brilliant Jew, he was actually a Frenchman named René Cassin. He was a Jewish Frenchman. And he was tasked with writing a document which would underpin international law and unite the nations of the world. So he began working on this with a particular group that they, a commission that they put together. And their job was to come up with a human rights declaration for the world. So in 1946, the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations set up this commission on human rights and the French government appointed this fellow, René Cassin, to the commission. And they were tasked with drafting a declaration. And they did. And the draft that they did, the original draft they came up with, he admits, included the entire contents of the 1789 French Declaration of the Rights of Man. And this draft later became the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UDHR. This declaration was based on the earthquake of Revelation 11, verse 13. The UDHR was adopted in Paris, and it forms the basis of what the United Nations is all about. How interesting is that? That a, the declaration adopted, the Universal Declaration adopted by the United Nations was done by a French Jew, largely designed by a French Jew, and adapted in Paris, France. Well, the frog-like spirits, the influence is still very alive today, brothers and sisters. To be clear, the unclean spirits of Revelation 16 are like frogs. So we need to keep that in mind. They resemble them. These spirits affect everything. They go everywhere. 
And the one common element is that like Pharaoh, they promise a false freedom in the name of liberty of the people. The French are very proud of their contribution to human rights, and they still want to claim their influence even today. In 2017, French President Emmanuel Macron, very interesting name by the way, gave a speech to the European Court of Human Rights, which is based in the German-French city of Strasbourg. And we read what he has to say. It's absolutely incredible what Emmanuel Macron, who they call the little Napoleon. They, they feel he's modeling himself after Napoleon. Here's what he had to say on that occasion. France's commitment to the principles enshrined in this convention goes back a long way. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen of 1789 is, of course, the main wellspring of those principles. It lies, its, its roots lie even deeper in the ground of Renaissance humanism, in the concept of the human being that France has constructed over the centuries, alongside those of freedom, emancipation, and education. It is not insignificant that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted in Paris in 1948. Nor is it coincidence that a French city, Strasbourg, is today your home. Macron sees Strasbourg as, very, as a very significant city, a very significant symbol for the rights, the human rights of man. Why? Well, on your right, you'll see a picture of the European Parliament building in Strasbourg, France. It's actually made to look like it's a work in progress. It makes it almost look like it's not finished. Well, they took their inspiration from a famous painting of the Tower of Babel made in the 1500s. So the European Union, they celebrated the opening of the new parliament and they produced this poster that you see on the screen. And the poster reads, Europe, many tongues, one voice. So what they're saying is that where the people failed to build the Tower of Babel in Genesis because of language problems, we will unite Europe and finish the work. It's absolutely remarkable. What a total lack of understanding of why God confounded the languages of man. God saw that man wanted to unite with man, not him. And so different languages were introduced to illustrate, to frustrate the work and to scatter the people. It compounded the problem rather than solve it. And the scriptures then clearly identifies the French Revolution, these frog-like spirits of liberty, equality, fraternity. You'll recall the symbols we talked about in our first session and earlier in our session today. The beast of Europe, the dragon, Russia, answering to the military might of the Eastern Empire, and finally the false prophet, the papacy based in Rome. So brothers and sisters, based on Revelation 16, we should start to see and we should expect to see that these three symbols are going to be speaking the same tongue. They're going to speak the same language. They're going to speak the language of the frog-like spirits. And we're going to give some illustrations of this and one even that occurred this year in our final session uh, together, God willing. Well, brothers and sisters, these frog-like spirits are causing the world to go mad. For they are the spirits of demons, working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. It's gathering the nations to Armageddon. But brothers and sisters, sadly, these demonic spirits have an effect on our thinking as well. And God willing, that will be the subject of our concluding class next week.